Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. What is going on? This is episode 178 of Bite That's Weekly Wrestling Podcast, the place where we break down the latest happenings inside of the WWE. This week, we have to talk about the latest and the first official Hall of Fame inductee for 2017, and that is the Olympic gold medalist Kurt Angle. We're going to be attending the Hall of Fame and have some more details about the WrestleMania weekend's plan on the road to WrestleMania, but we can be happier with all of this happening on the road to the Rumble. Remember, we are available every single Wednesday night on iTunes, YouTube, and in any of those platforms. Get the word out by dropping a five-star review, commenting on the videos, giving us thumbs up, sharing on social media. All this information is also available at ByteThat.com, as well as you can get yourself a raw and uncut video version of the podcast with mess-ups, with screw-ups, with great times, with terrible times, over at patreon.com slash bite that all together. My name is Juan Velas. I am from San Juan, Puerto Rico. I got to stop saying, uh, I got to start, stop saying from the shining star of the Caribbean because the shining stars aren't even relevant anymore. So yeah, I think you know what? that as, as somebody done. that was doing his best to keep that alive, I'm give you full permission to let it die now. Pull the plug if you'd like. So officially, I am no longer from the Shining Star. I'm just from Puerto Rico. And that guy that you heard, he's back. He was gone last week. He's here now. Cheer, insert crowd noise. Keith M. Poshik from Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Also here, Ryan McNulty from Boston, Massachusetts. Guys, we got to kick off the show hot and spicy because ESPN broke this story. I don't think anybody expected this in no way. Was this the thing? We were thinking about, okay, Diamond Dallas Page is maybe going to be the first inductee. There's something about Christian and rumors going on there. Bam, Kurt Angle. All of a sudden, oh, he's going to be inducted. It's true. I've been, I've been waiting to say that for days, and I feel real good about that. How did you guys feel about that the moment it came out? That happened a little bit before Raw, and yeah, it was mentioned by ESPN. And talk about an incredible induction for somebody that we've loved. You know, I've talked about Shane McMahon versus Kurt Angle being one of my favorite matches at King of the Ring 2001. How big is this for this year's Hall of Fame? At first, I was like, oh, that's that's cool. Kurt Angle seems like a good get. But then the more I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, it's Kurt Angle. I'm going to be there. Then they played Kurt Angle's theme on Raw. And I'm like, yeah, that's yeah. freaking Kurt Angle. And then the hype just kept building and building. And now I'm super excited. I'm even just like going back on the network this week uh, since the announcement and watching some of Kurt Angle's greatest matches. Like I rewatched the King of the Ring match with Shane because everybody should do that at every chance they get because it is one of the best matches of all time. His match with Brock Lesnar at WrestleMania 19, another incredible match. It's just getting me more and more hyped to see Kurt at the Hall of Fame. And I think it's a huge get and somebody that really deserves to be a top, like the top name in a Hall of Fame the year that he goes in. This was just so shocking because we've felt like WWE has been so hot and cold on Kurt Angle. We're like, oh, are they going to sign him? He's not going to sign him. Kurt Angle says he's going to go back to WWE and then everyone else says, no, that's not going to happen. So we really didn't know what the hell was going on. And then all of a sudden, just out of nowhere, we get this notification that, you know, I got it from the WWE app or whatever. It says Kurt Angle first inductee in the Hall of Fame. I'm like, holy crap, this is huge. And a lot of reasons why this is huge really has nothing to do with the Hall of Fame. It really has everything to do with, hey, Kurt Angle's on good terms with WWE now which means so many other things. It means he's back to, you know, they can make DVDs and he can be in interviews, stuff with the network. He can be in the video games again. He could possibly have an on-screen role in WWE, even just interacting or being like a manager of somebody. There's so many implications of just, hey, they've, you know, they've mended the bridge and now things can be good again between Kurt Angle and WWE because it's been over 10 years now since Angle's had really anything to do with WWE. That is unreal to think about because Kurt Angle, he's in that category for me of Stone Cold, The Rock, Triple H, The Undertaker. He's in that circle. So I think that 20 years can go by and it'll still feel like he left three years ago. Like when I watch a Kurt Angle clip in WWE, of course he was part of that. 
But then he had a longer career in TNA than WWE, which brings up it's another so point. crazy to think about. Yeah, it really is. And he's gone as far as to say, hey, I would love for WWE to highlight these matches that I had in TNA with guys like Samoa Joe and AJ Styles and have that video library. So who knows, right? Like, I think that we may be seeing... I think seeing- Angle shouldn't push it. I Dude, think he should okay, be happy we had that he's Christian, back. We had Christian, a WWE champion, show up in a TNA pay-per-view while he was employed by WWE, and that That's was related very, to the Hall different. of Fame. That is very, very different. That is the difference between TNA basically letting a WWE guy come back and WWE being okay with it versus WWE actually going out of their way to highlight something in TNA. Well, to be fair, over the last couple of years, they have been a lot more slack about it. Like, think about the AJ Styles podcast exactly. with Stone Cold Steve Austin, where they, they brought up specific moments in TNA. They even had, like, the pictures on the little Stone Cold True. drawn. Maybe TNA something, championship. something network-related could reference TNA, but I would be shocked. I'm not saying it won't happen, but I would be very, very shocked if any... WWE broadcast, like any TV, straight up like Raw or SmackDown or pay-per-view, actually showed any TNA footage on it. I'd be I very that shocked. That's what the network's for. It doesn't need yeah. to. And I think that WWE's changed enough. You know, we're going to be talking about a, a little bit regarding the UK tournament. And when you think about all that stuff, WWE in, in the last year is not the WWE that was when the network launched to where it was WWE, WWE. Now they're very open to including other people. There's rumors about maybe ICW or other independent companies showing up on the network. So more so than Kurt Angle, I see this as a big opportunity to just widen this, this array of content for the network. Then the next question is, is it just about the hall of fame? Look at your sting. Look at, All the other guys that have come back at some point, there is a match involved. There's even a rumor that Vince McMahon is planning, obviously take all of this with with a huge grain of salt, but that they're planning a match that we're all apparently going to love as fans. Kurt Angle's coming back. Apparently Undertaker versus John Cena may not be happening. John Cena and Kurt Angle was the first match that Cena had in the main roster. Given John Cena's current character of you got to go through me, I think Kurt Angle could easily go in and just say, hey, remember when you wanted to go through me? We're going to do this one more time. I think the story writes itself based on Cena's character, and I think that's where they're eventually going to lead to. And if that's the case, I'm getting some goosebumps right now because the idea of Kurt Angle coming out of WrestleMania for a match and the You Suck chant happening one more time, because it's respectful. I think we got to stop going like, You Suck chant, it's just part of his entrance. It has nothing to do with Kurt Angle being good or bad. He's even admitted to loving it and missing it. Would you guys like to see that match happen at Mania? Here's my two cents. Why highlight the Kurt Angle, AJ Styles matches that happened in TNA when you can make your own and make them better? Maybe at WrestleMania. That'd be pretty cool. There's Kurt can still go. plenty, plenty of Kurt Angle matches I'd love to see with him on the main, main roster. Um, I feel like uh, I even I talked about it recently. I'm pretty sure, but you know, any of interacting with any of the the Shield guys would be awesome to see. And just basically all the wrestlers who've come up since he's been gone. Never mind the fact that he'll still have great matches with people like AJ Styles and Brock Lesnar and all of that. I'm keeping my expectations at a reasonable level i'm happy about the hall of fame i'm happy that there's just that relationship is back that kurt angle is a part of wwe again uh the whole match thing we don't know we don't know if wwe doctors would clear kurt angle he's uh he's in pretty rough shape but you know what? If The Undertaker can still go and WWE clears him, there you go. that does give me hope that Angle could have a match in WWE. For now, I'm just happy that he's back. And I'm going to, you know, I'm, I'm not going to set myself up to be let down. Yeah, the, what we can say is that this is an excellent start to the Hall of Fame. So if you do add your DDP or possibly Christians, you're looking at a very, very solid class. That's that's more contemporary, right? Because you look at these three guys, DDP is not an 80s wrestler. He's remembered especially for being one of the later top guys in WCW, not so much in WWE, but then Christian, you know, part of the Attitude Era. So we're getting there where the Attitude Era is like the, the main thing, not just like your Stone Colts and your The Rocks, but they have, 
everybody else involved. So as more things come out about Hall, congratulations, fame, we're old. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean they've they've kind of like the Freebirds are in now, Macho Man's in. They've kind of cleaned up a lot of the stuff, the the big uh, omissions of the past. We really just got to get. Well, is Mister Perfect in there yet? I'm not sure. And I believe he is. I don't know. I honestly if he can't is. recall right now. Like Mister Perfect and Owen spot. Hart are kind of the last holdouts of like the pre Attitude era. I'm looking up. I'm looking this information so. up right now. No, he's not in the Hall of Fame. Oh wait, no, no, that wait, seems... wait. He was inducted into the Duty Hall of Fame in 2007. So okay, yes, he okay. was. See, this is the magic of the internet. If you don't have accurate information, try to look for it in the most nonchalant way possible, which is, of course, just saying it on the podcast that you're doing it right now to not sound like an idiot. Add a little bit more chalant in there, please. I need more chalant. I'll try. I'll try maybe for next time. Now. I think that this week, you know, we do have the Rumble next week, so I guess it's understandable that not a lot happened. Now, yeah, we have Mickey James making her return and the Elimination Chamber announcement, but the Mickey James thing has been a long-standing rumor, so now we're going to be getting to our Raw and SmackDown overall impressions. Remember that every week on Twitter, by that cast, we put up the polls immediately after each show to get your feedback regarding Raw. We saw that This is the first time we have a tie, but this is not a good tie. So 33% for both one out of four and two out of four, saying not good and okay. Only 6%, but the fact that even people voted for that is not too bad for uh, Raw. 6% said that it was amazing. Now looking at SmackDown Live, 61% said pretty good. Now I wanted to take things uh, just one step further on, on our Instagram. We don't plug that enough, bite that. And we asked there, and people's comments include, Raw just seems so clunky, and it's the same thing every Monday. SmackDown is more organized, and it has a more organic feel. Raw is too slow and not interesting, while SmackDown keeps the viewers into the show. So this is just the ongoing thing. But instead of just talking about this, because we have done this for so many weeks, one thing that was key this week for Raw was the exclusion of, of Mick Foley and Stephanie McMahon for whatever reason. Stephanie wasn't involved. Now, I at least enjoyed that part. I enjoyed that absence very much. I think that alone made Raw for a tolerable experience. What do you guys think about that? It really... See, the thing is, with no GMs on Raw, I didn't feel like Raw was any better, but it wasn't any worse either. So I just kind of feel neutral about it. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, let, let me let me ask this better. Considering we're talking about Stephanie, did it help you not want to change the channel or contemplate why you're watching? Yeah, that's actually you know what that that's a very good point. It like I, I didn't super enjoy Raw, but the fact that the GMs weren't there, I guess I should rephrase, made it much more easier to watch. Yeah, it's to go more on Ryan's first point. It's weird because. Yes, I am happy they weren't there because it's not just the same thing over and over every week again. Like, oh, hey, here, come do your promo. Trash talk somebody, maybe, and then make a match for later. But at the same time, it didn't feel like it, like, detracted from the show or added anything. It just felt like it was a thing that's there, which is really messed up when you think about that the GMs are one of the big centerpieces of the show. The fact that they can be omitted and it just feels exactly the same shows how strong of a sh- or strong of a part of a show that really the it really is so got all wordy weird there but don't worry about it man but some of the things that did happen let, let's just lump up these are some of the happenings so we had an opening promo including many of the guys we had this awkward thing between charlotte and bailey where charlotte was opening bringing out pictures that bailey has tweeted but then charlotte was doing it in a mocking sense which If she's the one that posted it, I'm pretty sure she's proud of those posts. And then Bailey does her Bailey thing, which is be awkward. I'm not going to say awkward in a good way. There is good awkward acting, right? Like uh, you look at, I don't know, 40-year-old virgin. You look at, I'm I'm just thinking about Steve Carell right now, really, when it comes to awkward acting. (laughs) You can do awkward (laughs) acting properly. But I think that Bailey, and I mean, she's said it in multiple interviews, she just sounds weird. Now, when she gets that baby face fired, you know, when she finally talked about her her father taking her to the shows and all that, I felt something there. 
but I don't get why she's the one that that's getting the push. And, and I think that's it's more of a problem that happens when you showcase maybe the weaknesses rather than the strengths. Because Bailey, they talk about her being the ultimate fan, but then the way Charlotte portrays it, it's like, are you guys proud of that or not? Because everybody was proud of that in NXT. Like, that was the whole thing. Like, yeah, she's the ultimate fan and she's a wrestler. Whereas with Raw, they treat it in negative light. Did you Bailey's care about that? character is in such a weird spot where it's almost like the further she moves away from her character, the more you feel like she belongs in the spot she's in. Because when it's the happy go lucky hug everybody, it's I'm sure there's there's a uh, there's a section for that and it goes really well with like the kids, but it's you feel less like oh she's a serious contender to Charlotte's title. And the fact that they have to go back and forth always creates this weird thing. And to go back to that segment itself, boy, was that a train wreck of an actual segment. Like when Charlotte was trying to read the poetry on the Titan Tron, but couldn't actually like bring out the words. So she was like mocking fans. Oh, well, why don't you read it then? That was not good at all. It, uh, it, was, a, it was a very poor display of both their characters uh, overall. I think this kind of just goes into an even more just an overall problem with Raw. But to, to get into the specifics first about why this segment didn't exactly work for me was just that it really didn't make you dislike Charlotte anymore because I feel like the crowd didn't really understand what Charlotte was supposed to be making fun of with Bailey. Like, oh, look how much she, of a fan she is. Oh, no. Isn't that embarrassing? Oh my god and the crowd's like uh okay uh, I'm, I'm not really like I don't understand why I'm supposed to be mad about this or angry Charlotte sounded dumb let's let's summarize yeah. she sounded dumb it, it didn't seem like she had a good argument for why Bailey was undeserving or whatever it just it didn't go over well but you know this segment and raw like Bailey's character in a lot of things it just feels like Bailey's character has had no progression. You know, a lot of characters on Raw have had no pr progression. It just feels like everything is frozen in time in on Raw and we just keep we just move from one thing to another, but there's really no journey. It's just a series of events that happen, but it doesn't feel like there's any connection between any of them. And that's what's so great about SmackDown is we feel like there's a progression constantly going on. Like, hey, look, Baron Corbin slowly making his way to the top of the car. And now he's facing John Cena. Oh, we didn't beat him quite yet, but he, you know, he's still climbing his way back. Um, there's there's just so much going on there. The story with the Wyatts and all that. And Raw is just uh, this happened and then this happened and then this happened with nothing to, to bring it all together. Um, and, you know, the only progressive story is the, the Owens and Jericho story, really. And uh, who knows uh, when when that uh, is actually going to come to a head. But yeah, Bailey, we've just never been taken through that journey on TV with her. So we don't even like understand where Bailey's really at right now. Like they didn't really st she should have started off as the super fan again as weird as it would have been for her to regress we talked about NXT. that way before yeah. she actually showed up in the main roster yeah we, we bring this up a lot but we need to be taken through that journey the the typical raw crowd probably just doesn't understand bailey's character i don't understand bailey's main roster character so i don't know we just we need that journey yeah you look at a situation like the tag title match which is another just odd thing so you have Sheamus and Cesaro, who just became the tag team champions. But then the crowd, they're pro Cesaro, but then naysayers for Sheamus. So then logically, you put them up against the club in a situation where the club almost won the tag titles. But then there was a screwy finish and then it was reversed. So we were supposed to be upset that the bad guys didn't become tag team champions. And then the good guys that fought so hard to win the tag titles did retain their titles because the bad guys took it because Sheamus took out the referee. Like what is happening? It just seems like all of raw is a, it's just a neutral ground. Raw is a sitcom where SmackDown is a movie. Raw is like, you're that 70 show. You're three's company. Huh. When you That's think about analogy. it. Yeah. Because a sitcom is meant to feel like background TV. You look at friends. Friends is a, is a show that has progression 
but you can watch an episode from season two and then season four and you get an idea. This is the good guy. This yeah, is the bad guy. Or this like is someone that Simpsons, I care about. Exactly. You're supposed to feel comfortable. At the end of the day, you know, Homer Simpson may get the horse to, to ride and become like a jockey or whatever. But at the end of the day... That horse isn't going to be there the next episode because everything we're back to we're back to zero. We're back to the status quo. So, it's so just then so who weird. are the Rachel and Ross of Monday Night Raw? It's the Simpsons. It's not Friends. Friends actually has progression sometimes. It does. But you get the point, though, where it's characters that you're familiarized with. But then Kevin for Owens example, is Homer. Yeah. Marge is Chris Jericho. Bart like, Simpson is... Uh, Seth Rollins is probably Bart. <laughs> yeah, I could see him being Bart. Who's you Roman look at Reigns? Situa- Who does uh, nobody like on The Simpsons? Uh, Roman Reigns. He's like Mr... No, M- McMahon is Mr. Burns. Roman Reigns He's probably like be... comic book guy or somebody. I don't know. Who's somebody that just is <laughs> Roman hated Reigns on is it. obviously Poochie, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, poor... Come on. Come on. Poor guy. But yeah, uh, I guess what I'm trying to say with all of this is that there's a lot of work that needs to be done. You look at the situations between Enzo, Cass, and Rusev, and it's just the same thing. Like the one of the only things that's progressing is Neville. Like Neville is just on fire. We talked about Alicia Fox at the end of last week's show because we completely forgot about it. So we edited the edit that in edited that in with our Ryan. And then New Day and Titus just keeps happening. Because it keeps happening. That is that is about all I can really say about Raw. Is there? A, am I saying it properly? Because I just don't know how to feel about it. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I think you're filler. accurate. It, it's been filler for like the New Day Titus thing has been the ultimate filler. It's the ultimate. We have no idea what to do with these guys. <laughs> We're only gonna have four actual matches aside from the Rumble coming up. So what do we do with the rest of the roster? You're just going to spin your wheels. Filling three hours is not easy. Apparently not. So now let's actually get to some better conversations and talk about SmackDown Live. Now, we do have some specific topics here. Number one is uh, Mickey James making her return. That was the main event match on SmackDown Live. You know, Alexa Bliss defended against Becky Lynch. She retained the whole night. Everybody was... uh, it was pretty much expecting La Luchador to reveal herself. I mean, rumors have come out that it was going to be maybe Deanna Parasso. And then eventually, here, he, here she, he is. Here she is. It is a female. Mickey James is revealed to a very lackluster reaction. And I think it's because pretty much everybody knew that it was going to be Mickey. a decent reaction. Look, look back. I do you mean, mean going to edit that on the YouTube channel? Do you mean like channel. internet response or crowd response? No, like the crowd. The crowd. I like thought the, the crowd responded so. yeah. There's probably like realistically, if the entire crowd like isn't the network people, there's probably a high chance most of them are like, who? Mickey who? They probably, it's been long enough that maybe not everybody really knows who Mickey James is and maybe that uh, dampered it a little bit, but... While it's cool that she's on the SmackDown roster, did that whole thing feel off? Especially Mickey James's assault against Becky Lynch. It felt weird. It almost felt kind of like that was the old style of women's wrestling where Mickey James's kicks didn't really look all that strong or effective looking. And uh, it felt... It didn't feel like, oh, hey, Mickey James is there beating the crap out of Becky Lynch. Like, oh, it kind of kicked her in the face, I guess. That's that's cool. It was weird. I thought it, didn't it looked feel impactful, right. maybe. Yes. Like, I, I didn't I think it was... I can see where you're coming from. There were words, words. Ryan, you, you, you say some first, and then I'll talk. Yeah, I mean, I'm still excited to see what happens with this. It's kind of a... It's a new layer to the the SmackDown women's division. It's a nice way for Becky to transition into another feud without having to deal with the title because she's mainly just been about the SmackDown Women's Championship. I don't really know where this leaves Alexa for now. Maybe they'll do a tag team feud for a little while just because there actually really isn't a contender for Alexa right now because we already have Natalia and uh, Nikki Bella kind of wrapped up in another feud that really only leaves Naomi as potentially the other challenger because uh, the only like we got Carmella in a different storyline. She's a heel. So it's either a tag team feud, 
And I, I think either way, Naomi's going to probably have to come into the picture for this. While I have no doubt it would be a great set of matches, I hope that Nikki, Bella, and Mickey James never feud because that will be the most impossible thing to talk about. How so? Nikki, Mickey, Nikki, try, Mickey. Try talking about how Nikki and Mickey are fighting over and over. It'll be Mickey, the worst. Mickey, we'll Mickey, say, Mickey, we'll Mickey, say Mickey, Nikki. Mickey, Mickey. Uh, we'll say Nikki when we mean Mickey and Mickey when we mean... mean. See, it's already hard to say. <laughs> it's already <laughs> happening. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I, I don't think that it was uh, an excellent close out for the show, but I'm happy Mickey's there. They need that because we've talked about that where... I think you just did it, but... No, he did got I, it right. He it? got oh, okay. it right. Never mind. <laughs> oh, see, now, now you got me second guessing myself. I'm talking about Mickey, not Nikki or Mickey Rook. I'm talking about Mickey James. The fact that she's there shows that they're willing to introduce some new people every now and then. You know, we've said, like, how long can we get, like, uh, Baron Corbin, Apollo Crews? Like, we get all these triangle storylines. But now that you got her in there and that she's a heel, I'm happy that she's you know a heel. It's very easy to go to the baby face route. You get the question of, are her and Alexa just going to take over the women's division? I do think that they should maybe do something like that. I think both personalities are well enough that they can do that because then you pull in your Naomi. Where Naomi, I think people still treat her as a diva, not a woman's wrestler because people remember her from the, the Funkodactyls. I think that even though people like her entrance, she's not treated to the same tier that Becky Lynch, Sasha, and everybody else is. So you can pull her together in this tag team feud, maybe, and eventually you can have either a triple threat SmackDown Women's Championship match at WrestleMania or maybe like a one-on-one -on -one match. But you have options for the first time in a while. And it's not like SmackDown has been doing bad, you know, because of that. But it definitely helps that they're willing to introduce somebody else to uh, change things up a bit. Now, the next topic that I do want to move on to is a little is a little weird. I'm very curious about your uh, responses here. It's King Scorch. So Jerry the King Lawler came back, didn't feel like wearing a shirt. He always wears <laughs> a shirt on the announcer table, but then just said, hey, I'm going to interview Ziggler. So I'm going to get naked in the ring with him. Why not? So this is, you know, you know following Dolph up. Dolph seems like an all right person for that to happen with. He see I'm not going to no, judge anything. No, I, but. I was, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not even going to attempt to go into that right now. But yeah, Dolph Ziggler is still playing the serious character. I'm surprised by the, the route that they're taking where he's not, he's not lashing out. He's being very introverted. He's keeping to himself. But then they air... The 2012, which is insane to think about, that it was in 2012 that Jerry the King Lawler suffered from that heart attack. To me, it's still like two years ago, but it was multiple years ago now. How did you guys react when they played this thing that very much happened? Even though CM Punk had already done this weeks after it happened, actually. So that was way worse. But we still got this as a way to get the bad version of Ziggler established on SmackDown. My first reaction was, holy crap, Dolph Ziggler looks so much different now. My second reaction was, you know, because at first when they showed the clip, I was like, man, is this is this the heart attack clip? Like, obviously, they didn't show afterwards, uh, luckily. But um, I thought this was an interesting way to really to to find kind of a new edge to Dolph Ziggler to kind of show that there's this sadistic side to him. Um, and, you know, this is something that was never addressed in four years with Ziggler and, and King. And obviously, a, a lot of that time, Ziggler's been a babyface, so it didn't seem like the right time to do it. Um, but I, I think they handled it really well. It immediately gave a reason for Jerry the King Lawler and Dolph Ziggler to be there. It didn't feel like, oh, Jerry Lawler's here just to be here. No, this might actually lead to something interesting, and it's it's getting Ziggler's new heel kind of persona over with this sadistic, calculated side. Now, they're in there, and they're really gonna play off of this whole like loser thing because you have to really accept what it is. Dolph Ziggler loses all the time now, so you might as well use that in there as well. So I'm really digging it so far, and. 
Uh, I'm curious to see if Jerry Lawler is going to continue to be involved or if this was sort of a one-off deal. This reminded me a lot of Jericho in around 2008. Remember when he punched uh, Shawn Michaels' wife and like legitimately punched her? So now he does something similar where Dolph Ziggler is this quiet character, as you mentioned, Ryan calculated. He didn't just super kick him in the face. He super kicked him in the Mm -hmm. chest. Do you remember years ago when uh, Billy Kidman botched a shooting star press and then it made the shooting star press way more effective than it was beforehand? It's almost something like that where now you see an elbow drop from Dolph Ziggler like, hey, that almost killed Jerry Lawler. It's way more effective than it was a couple of weeks ago. That's not giving you legitimacy. As messed up as it is, it gives it more legitimacy. Mm -hmm. Like when he does that 10 elbow combo now, you're going to be like, oh, my God, this is this is brutal. He should call that the heart attack combo or something like that to just always remind people. And yeah, in an era where we're so PG about this, because some people were going, this is going too far. CM Punk brought that up like, what was it, two to three weeks after? Yeah, when Jerry Lawler like first came back, he had took, a fake yeah, heart attack in the months. ring. It took a couple months for Lawler Paul to Barrett. come back. Okay, let's bring that another example. A man died, and they <laughs> brought out the urn like two weeks later, two to three weeks later, to further develop the storyline between Undertaker and CM Punk. Now, this is not to justify, but it's been years since he had the heart attack. He's he seems to be you know very happy with what he's doing. This uh, su- supports wrestling growth. You, we get a new version of Ziggler. I don't really see what the problem is. If if uh, Jerry the King Lawler was in a really weak condition right now, then okay, because you never know what's going to happen. But as long as he's okay with it, you know, gets gets a new story going. So I'm very, very happy about that. Now, Shane McMahon did come out on SmackDown to kick off the show and announce that there will be, this is, this is unreal, there's going to be an Elimination Chamber match at the Elimination Chamber pay-per-view, guys. What? Yeah. This is happening. I I don't even know what to say right now, considering that they already put the graphic a while back. Now, we didn't really know, like, when it... I mean, we knew when it was going to happen. Just, it's uh, weird that we're getting this announcement before the Rumble. So, even how he went about explaining it, it's weird because uh, we were talking about this before we hit the record button. They can't really tell anybody to say they want to be in that match because then you're basically saying, hey, I'm going to lose in the Rumble. So I don't want to be in this match or 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 do I want to be in this match? Are you excited about this as a obstacle or a roadblock on the road to WrestleMania? No, oh. the, the Elimination Chamber is one of my favorite matches of the year. So just from that, I'm excited. It did feel like a weird time to uh, start talking about it with the Royal Rumble just a couple of weeks away because it's like, hey, we're not going to say too much beyond it's happening, but it's happening. Wait for but it. For, hey, there's a, there's this thing that's happening even before it that we're, we need to talk about called the Royal Rumble, and I guess we'll get back to the chamber once uh, once the Rumble's over, so stay tuned. It felt very weird. Yeah, doing this, uh, it's almost like they announced this for a reason but it also was awkward because if you think about it, right, we didn't know. So we know Elimination Chamber is a SmackDown pay-per-view, but we didn't know it was going to be for the title. So I think it was important that Shane McMahon say, hey, after the Rumble, this match will be for the title because in previous years, they have used the Elimination Chamber for the other brand to establish who's going to go to WrestleMania for, you know, SmackDown or Raw or whatever when the uh, the other side had won the Royal Rumble. So by stating that this is for the title, it makes us believe, OK, so it's not just auto Raw wins this because we know SmackDown could win it, too. It kind of it takes away sort of in uh, like a conclusion we could jump to that would make the rumble more predictable. So I think that's one of the main reasons that they did this. Um, and yeah, they, they kind of have to walk this fine line of really not saying who's going to be in the match, just that it's going to happen because yeah, we don't want to spoil who probably isn't going to win the rumble. Cause if you win the rumble, why are you going for the title then when you have a solo shot at WrestleMania? 
That is, unless you're Baron Corbin, who on Talking Smack mentioned that he wants to win the Rumble and that match and then face himself at WrestleMania, which could be one of the greatest matches of all times. He's just sitting there playing Jenga by himself, maybe, just some board games. But if there's one thing I will give SmackDown credit, that, yeah, even though this is a little bit awkward how you announce things before other things have even happened... It reminded me of when they built up the match between Becky Lynch and Alexa Bliss. Like, not this one, but the one from uh, Glasgow, I believe it was, in, in England. Like, the, the fact I remember when a match took place shows that they're able to build things up, not just for next week, but for whenever it's happening, because you got to seek that out. So even though we have the Rumble, we already know. Okay, regardless of what happens at the Rumble, the title is going to be on the line. The title is going to be on the line. So that gives you intrigue. That gives you build up, as opposed to just, well, here's the next pay-per-view. Fork over your money. Fork over your nine ninety nine. Come on, go ahead. It just gives yeah, that's you an happening on thing. Raw instead. <laughs> exactly. Another point for SmackDown. Now, folks, remember that we are going to be having a 12-hour wrestling video game marathon happening on Saturday, February 4th. I do want to thank everybody that hung out with me this past weekend over at uh, twitch.tv slash TV. I played about two hours of WWE 12 for the PlayStation 3. You guys can check that out right now over at vid.me slash by that. I put a improved quality version of that as a road to the uh, stream. We're going to be playing a variety of wrestling games across, uh, you know, PS1, PS2, 3, 4, all that stuff. And that's thanks to our patrons. We're on the way to the second goal. This is part of the first goal over at patreon.com slash by that. We always love to give shout outs, particularly to our goal patrons. That is a perk that you do get. The same thing with a uh, your name at the end graphic of our YouTube videos. So the weekend videos, you get that just by being a gold patron. So Ryan, who are we thanking this week? This week for our lovely patrons, we'd like to thank Joe Wingdingland, USC Punk, and Ashley Hudson. Thank you guys for your support. Uh, it goes a, it goes a long way to a lot of cool things, including the, our upcoming 12-hour wrestling video game stream. So thank you. Now, this is usually when I just go back to the topics. But Ryan did mention that something special is going to be happening regarding the Rumble. Like, number one, we do have the Shut Your Rumble happening this next Friday. This next Saturday, actually. I'm getting the dates wrong now. Where we play it and shut your mouth. Uh, We have a couple of graphics across social media. Name your pick. If you happen to get it right, you're going to get a shout out. So it's a CPU control game. But that's not enough. We wanted to sweeten the pot. So now, Keith, you can go O now. Now you can do the O thing. Okay. Ready for it? Go for it. Okay. Yeah, do it. Yeah, guys. We have a giveaway that I don't understand how to actually explain it. So now I'm just going to take it back to Ryan, who can then explain it properly. Keith. So clearly you guys have figured out that I'm heading up this giveaway. We're going to be doing a WWE Royal Rumble pool. Now... This is going to be happening over on Twitter. That is where you're going to enter into this. So the winner will get a $10 Amazon gift card from either uh, Amazon Canada, uh, US, or UK. So if you can get something from those, uh, then you're eligible. So how it works is look for on our Twitter, twitter.com slash bite that cast. You're going to look for a tweet. It's going to be pinned to the top of our profile. So keep checking tomorrow. And that's going to be uh, Thursday, Thursday, January 19th. What's going to happen is you are going to reply to that tweet. There'll be a code in the picture on the tweet. And you will be assigned a number. So there's going to be 30 spots. There's only 30 spots available. All right. We're only promising that there's going to be one pool. And you will be assigned a number from 1 to 30 randomly. And that number will be your entrance. So watching the 2017 Royal Rumble, if uh, you have number 13 and Heath Slater comes out at number 13 and then he wins the whole damn Rumble, well, you just won yourself a $10 Amazon gift card. So there's going to be 30 spots open. Check our Twitter on uh, January 19th and the first 30 replies are going to be entered. There'll be a Anything picture in particular with the that they got to reply? There will be, it will be in the graphic of the tweet what you have to reply with. It'll be easy. It'll be like a one-word thing. 
All you have to do is reply to it. If you're in the first 30, you will then be randomly assigned a number. And from there, you just watch the rumble and enjoy and you cheer on your entry number. Oh boy. So guys, gang, bike club, get ready because the rumble stakes, they're up high. So we got the Shut Your Rumble happening this Saturday and then the actual Royal Rumble happening the weekend after. Ryan, as he mentioned, $10 Amazon gift card. We actually do have as well uh, some other features coming out for a patron coming down the pipeline very soon. So stay on the lookout for that. Now, this is a story that I'm, I'm so happy that this happened. I mean, not that it is a good thing or a bad thing, but Randy Orton is the modern era Stone Cold Steve Austin just in real life. Like not the character. I'm not talking about the character. This is Randy Orton. So what happened? Uh, have you guys read about the story? I've read a little uh, bit about it. A little bit. So what happened was, and uh, I'm crediting Cage Side Seats for this recap version. There is a website that covered that, you know, during Raw, there's always a SmackDown Live taping, a SmackDown Live house show or a live event. So this happened um, in Northeast Arkansas. And uh, Randy Orton was at a gym just doing gym stuff. I mean, he, he's he's in shape, right? So that requires some effort. And while he was at gym lifting some weights, a fan came over to him and basically wanted to take a picture with him. Now, Randy Orton was uh, he had earbuds on so he couldn't hear. So the fan, I guess either he misunderstood or whatever happened. He walked back and then proceeded to just take a picture of Randy Orton exercising. This picture is actually out on social media. He's wearing a WWE 2K14 jacket, so he's got some good taste. But his face... Yeah, he knows the right game to wear. <laughs> yeah, but the, his face tells the story of, I want to <laughs> F you up so badly right now as a fan. I want to murder your soul because gym time is personal time. That is a very... You don't mess with somebody while they're lifting weights. So this fan was saying that Randy Orton proceeded to tell him to F off, just all sorts of things. And this is spiraled out of control. Now, Randy Orton being Randy Orton goes, uh-uh, hey, I'm just going to get on this. So these are actual tweets from Randy. Uh, I'm just going to read them out because it's better than paraphrasing. Apparently, I hurt a fan's feelings when I told him to F off at the gym yesterday. That's news. That's been happening for 15 years. Hashtag get a life. That's the first tweet. Then this is the second one that I want to take it over to you guys. I paid to train in between every set. I can't take pictures. He needs to suck it the F up and go to the gym to train and not be a fanboy. And then he calls him a bitch later on. <laughs> I mean, I'm on Randy's side with this one. I think Randy is 100% in the right. Like, he, it's gym time, like you said, is concentration time. And if you are, like, you're not on the clock, if you want privacy and stuff, as, like, you're, people are entitled to privacy. People are enti to, entitled to me time. So if this is something that he didn't want to do, somebody should have respected that. And uh, he... The worst thing that guy did was post that to social media because if Randy was telling him, delete that, I don't want that out there, he he basically disrespected Randy's wishes. And from that alone, I think that Orton is 100% in the right there. And as a man that does not like to be bothered in the gym, I totally feel what Randy's getting at. Probably his was 100 times more being famous and all, but... It's yeah. If people yeah. are like, "Oh, Randy is being please. a dick," they do need to suck it the Can f you, up. I'm right. with Randy. When Keith goes to the gym, guys, you just give him space. All right. I know the bike club is ravenous, but leave Keith alone. I know he's a big deal, but l let's give him some space. All right. Uh, no, I, I agree I with you punch though. Punch you in the face right now. <laughs> <laughs> you real talk, like not trying to hype myself up or anything it is a it is a thing people getting in your personal yeah, really space is. when you're when you're in, at the gym you want to murder them especially I just found it, a new way to trigger keys no, anyway no, dude no, no, okay before we say like if you're wearing earbuds at a gym that don't is code word for me. don't talk to me i like if these weights have a weird angle I can break my arm. Like, this is yeah. not like, you know, the only just acceptable touchy question stuff. at that time is, are you done using this equipment? If, and then yes or no. And that's the end of the conversation. It's the only acceptable thing going on then. All right. So, yeah, weighing in on this, um, 
pretty much on board with you guys. There's a time and a place for taking pictures with superstars and that's meet and greets or maybe after a show or before a show. But when somebody's at the gym, that's their own personal time. Now, if you do run into a WWE superstar at the gym, I would say that if you are going to do anything, it's maybe when they're on their way out and you just shake their hand, you say, hey, thank you for what you do or whatever. And that's it. I wouldn't even say pictures or anything like that. But if you want to just say hi, I would probably wait until they're going to leave. And apparently another person at the gym was able to take a photo with him. Even Randy responded to people saying that, hey, you know, I I paid for your career. Like, you know, you're here because of the fans. He said, wait till I'm done. Then oh, cool. do I hate that? That's like the C- <laughs> that's what people used to say to see him. Hey, Punk Phil, I bought your house. <laughs> yeah. 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 So Just if, wrong. We if you are up. out there, if you are out there and you have that mindset, check yourself, check your privilege. Exactly. Yeah. If you're respectful and smart about meeting WWE superstars and celebrities, then you will probably have a good experience. But if you're selfish and you just want to have proof with a picture or whatever, and you don't care about their time, you're just trying to do it for yourself, you're probably going to have a bad experience. You're going to have a bad time. That's true. And the closing thought, as I was uh, saying there, is that gym time for you know, wrestlers and superstars, that's part of their job. Like Randy's physique is part of his job. So when he's at gym, he's not there because he's bored and that's like, "Eh, I'll go to gym. It's no, your job requires that. There's an action figure that has a 10 pack. So you got to have a 12 pack to make up the difference there. So just, just, just be worried. They're human beings. They like personal space. How would you feel if you were at gym just sitting somewhere and they take a picture of you're you. missing an article man <laughs> at the gym sorry yes. oh, oh you were triggering me so hard <laughs> <laughs> sorry sorry so but god ow. okay so now we're gonna talk about the wwe uk tournament that took place this past weekend with a much different format the cruiserweight classic was a weekly event this was a weekend event that spanned across two days so it was the people from day one just all sorts of matches with, I believe it was a 15 minute time limit. And then basically the ones that survived battled. And then on the second day, the champion was crowned. The champion is 19 years old. So Tyler Bate, incredibly talented. I watched the first step, the first couple of matches from day one and they were okay. Not going to say I was sold. And then I watched the main event match for day two. So I've not watched all of it. So the initial thing is, have you guys watched or at least seen clips or the feeling Ryan's face already tells me? No, <laughs> no, I'm, just, I'm just, always I that guy. you know me. Yeah, I've uh, I've seen the first couple of matches of day one and all of day two. And uh, I really like the UK tournament. I was definitely disappointed at first, just comparing it to the cruiserweight classic but after a little while i came to realize that this that's not a fair comparison this is not the cruiserweight classic yes it's a tournament but it felt so different and once i got out of that mindset i thought it was really good i enjoyed most of day two's matches really but really uh the the turning point for myself there was at the end of day one when uh i always forget his name peter peter dune peter dunn uh pete dunn was yeah, he, he uh, when when I'll look yes. this information up while you talk. <laughs> Thank We're you. Still when learning he, when about he, these guys. Exactly. Honestly, this was a lot of or most of the tournament, if not all, this was my first exposure to them and I was impressed by a lot of it. But when he attacked another competitor, I'm like, "Oh, okay, this is very different than uh very different than the Cruiserweight Classic. This is more of a story." than anything else and they were it was it was really more like a tournament in nxt than it was this like cruiserweight classic feel and once i got over that i really enjoyed the tournament and like juan said the main event is fantastic the fact that it was spoilers it was one with a tiger driver made me the happiest little man because that's one of my favorite moves and uh, yeah overall i definitely say it's worth a watch it's only like four hours long which is crazy to think about a 16 person tournament in that time frame but they really nailed it yeah, it was smart about how they went about uh, the time limit because in kayfabe terms, right? How do you justify that these guys can magically just defeat each other in a pretty quick span of time 
Well, they know they have a time limit, so they got to go all out within that time limit to make sure that they do advance because then they risk double elimination or something like that. So right off the bat, that helped. And the commentary team between Michael Cole and Nigel McGuinness was outstanding. You know, people give Michael Cole praise and they forget like Raw, Raw is bad because Raw as a show is bad. Not because of the people in it. You look at the roster, you look at everything. Raw has the talent to be the best damn wrestling show on earth. Like just outside of WWE. But there are other things at hand. Maybe the demographic is different. Maybe just the wrestling part's not good. Maybe announcer just got to plug 20 different things throughout the show. But Michael Cole and its raw core, no pun intended, is an outstanding commentator. And that commentary team with Nigel McGuinness, man, it works so damn well that I'm Excellent. wondering what's going to happen now. Because we do have a UK champion. As I mentioned, he's 19. We're almost 10 years older than the UK champion. How do you guys feel about huh. that? Horrible. I don't want to talk about that. Let's go back to the tournament. But one thing that I will say that it was more successful in the Cruiserweight Classic in was making me excited for the spin-off network show where they actually had storylines and people developing themselves throughout the tournament. It was a really good... This tournament was really a, like a jump-off point for the WWE UK show. And I think it was way more successful in that than the Cruiserweight Classic was for the Cruiserweight division. Because at the end of the, uh, when somebody was eliminated from the Cruiserweight tournament, it's just like, okay, well, that's the end of them. But actual people, like, I'm I'm so sorry that I'm screwing up these names, but the guy that's uh, Finn Balor's, uh, was Finn Balor's apprentice. Yes, yes, the, I uh, the Finn Balor he, lookalike guy. The Finn, the guy that looks like Finn and was trained by Finn, he had actual character development throughout that tournament where it was whole, he wants to get out of Finn's shadow. That That is something that can go right into the new show. Same with uh, the main event. That is something that they can pick right up on once uh, once they start that show. It was way more successful than the Cruiserweight Classic. In that so if way. he looks like Finn and he was trained by Finn, is he Finn? Bauer is he the Damon? His name is the Jordan Damon. Devlin, by the way. Jordan Devlin is who we're Jordan talking Devlin, about. That's it. Devlin Damon. Eh? I think that what WWE did with the Cruiserweight Classic is that they experimented. I don't think they ever thought about having a Cruiserweight show until the CWC started and they realized there was something. So with the UK show, they just go, okay, we know the tournament that's format true. works, that's so let's build point. it up. And now AAA has confirmed that there will be a women's tournament possibly around summertime. So I'm looking forward to all of this. Like eventually maybe they can do a super heavyweight tournament and then we can see super heavyweights in ways that we've not seen them before. Because when we think super heavyweight, we're thinking Mark Henry, Big Show, who has a six pack now. So he's trying to get, you know, the Finn Balor yeah, that's look crazy. going. Big Show, man. We, we got to get to at least Big Show shape before WrestleMania. But that's that's, that's not totally happening. not happening. <laughs> there was a There's many ways to get interpret news. That. Shout out to KFA News on this one, but there was an article where the uh, or a joke article on there where they talk about 405 Live yeah. <laughs> this yeah. week, and I didn't realize how badly I want 405 Live until I saw that article. It's the best. I'll take they a hard pass ninja. on that one. They got to continue to use the CWC Ninja for the graphics. Just really <laughs> Just fat. a giant ninja. But instead, he like he acts like the juggernaut, where instead of doing all these flips, he just breaks through a wall. <laughs> I want to be disappointed when this doesn't happen. <laughs> Don't pay suicide by the big show. Except it's Dios a real mio. suicide. <laughs> so the, the only thing I wanted to say on the UK tournament, because obviously I'm a terrible person once again and didn't watch it, but... I think it, it's great that there is some sort of WWE representation in the UK because they have such a passionate fan base that they'll be able to have a show that, you know, they'll broadcast on the network at a reasonable time for them to watch. And, it, you know, it's it's showing some love. It, it allows them to attend some of these shows live, even if it's not all WWE uh, main roster superstars. It's a WWE produced show for them, which I think is great. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to what's going to be happening. 2017 has already started off hot with all this stuff, just different things that we never thought would possibly happen in WWE. You know, we're going to be on WrestleMania weekend. You know, we're getting ready for that. It's real. WrestleMania is less than three months away. 
So we've been oh, thinking about man. things, you know, just what what do we do there? You know, uh, there are events like WrestleCon. Uh, for those that are traveling to WrestleMania, we actually have a WrestleMania private Facebook group. So if you are traveling there confirmed and you want to at some point maybe hang out with us, like, you know, be able to attend one of these shows or meet us possibly at WrestleCon or something, you can send us an email. Just let us know with the headline Facebook group or on Twitter, send us a DM and all any kind of social media with, uh, you know, letting us know that's going to be happening so we can add you there. And we've been experimenting with different things to uh, do there during that weekend, right? Because if we just do like a square round table or just podcast format live, that's all cool. But we can just as easily do that here, right? It's just us talking about wrestling. So we're trying to think about different ways to do this, maybe possibly doing live streaming during WrestleMania weekend. So uh, if you haven't, you know, follow us on Facebook, Bite That Cast, because we're going to experiment. We're not confirming that it's going to be through Facebook yet. We're experimenting with uh, Twitter, Periscope, Facebook Live. YouTube, unfortunately, is not we're that gonna friendly. We're going to test out a couple platforms because uh, we, we want to, you know, especially if we're going to live stream us at WrestleCon or other events or just, you know, in Florida or in Orlando during WrestleMania weekend, if we happen to be talking about something like reviewing WrestleMania or whatever, we want to be able to also put a lot of that important content on the YouTube channel as well and, and possibly for audio as well. So we're just, you know, looking at different platforms for the best way that, hey, we can do this live and then we can deliver that content elsewhere as well. And I mean, really, when you break it down to the real reason on why they're do or why we're doing this, it's just how can we make Juan dressing up as AJ Lee shut as up, embarrassing shut up, stop, 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 stop. as possible. So why not live stream it on the Internet? <laughs> oh, my God. Light it up. No co-workers better find that. And the, the closing question for this is having said all of this. What does everybody that's listening right now think that we should work on during WrestleMania weekend? It, it can just be, you know, some a couple of streams and Q&As and stuff. It can just be us talking, like completely not even about wrestling. But just think about you're always going to get the podcast. You're always going to get the play that videos on the YouTube channel. What can we do at WrestleMania weekend that we otherwise could not do because of the physical limitations of me not being able to physically punch Keith or Ryan in the face? So send us, you know, uh, suggestions on Twitter, by that cast or on YouTube. Email. I have some ideas. Oh, Keith has ideas. I'm, I'm very afraid of that. So I'm just going to leave that at that right now. So now we get to the main event, which is actually your awesome questions. You send them every week to our email, bitethatcast at gmail.com. You also send them through Twitter. Bite that cast utilizing the hashtag SBT. We're across most social media, but those are the two most active platforms for your questions. We always appreciate that. I listen to a lot of podcasts and I don't necessarily or ever have sent in questions. That should change. So don't don't follow my advice. Like don't be me. Like break that silence. Send questions. They can be outrageous. Lose that fear. Bray Wyatt taught us to lose fear. No, he shouldn't taught us to live in fear. No, that that's actually wrong. So Keith, just just go ahead, man. Don't don't right, follow my you, advice buddy. at all. So our first question comes from Kane Yo Yo, Yo, who asks, "What are your thoughts on the Wendy's Twitter account tweeting about pro wrestling? This has been a trend recently of social media, like restaurant social media accounts, just getting weird. It's like they're." The people that handle these just have been getting crazy recently. But what do you guys think about stuff like this? I think it's, I think it's hilarious when you think about all this stuff. The fact that uh, you you have Wendy's tweet about the Indy Taker and the Wendy Taker things related to the Bullet Club. It's kind of funny because this is all this is all part of a, an elaborate plan. Did we mention this last week, or am I having like a really weird case of deja vu? I don't know. I wasn't here. I couldn't tell you one way or the other. <laughs> well, just in case we just in case we did. I think that this is all a bunch of uh, fast food chains getting together because this week on in Puerto Rico. So this is happening on a local level. A female posted a picture of a Popeye's employee, you know, Popeye's fast food chain 
uh, saying, hey, he's 28 years old. Like, what are you doing there in the front That's desk? That's so weird. Like, we're, we're talking about the Randy Orton thing, right, about privacy. Here's a guy just working. And people are saying, like, why are you 28 years old still working in fast food? So then now, magically, most other fast food places in Puerto Rico are tweeting pictures of their good-looking employees saying, hey, we prefer our 28-year-old employee, which just led me to believe that this is all just one huge plan that we are all falling into easily because it's fun. It's engaging, but it's all part of a big plan. And these companies are very much involved with each other. So here's something that I just learned about the differences between Canada and America. Your Popeye's is like a fast food chicken place. Yeah. Yeah. It's like KFC. Ours, that's, oh, that's so weird because Popeye's for me is like a supplement store, like where you get protein and fat <laughs> burners and stuff like that. Because like Popeye, like toot toot, the giant muscle man. Yeah, yeah. That's that makes sense. sense though? It makes it makes way more sense than your fast food chicken place. But God, talk about such a polarizing difference. Y'all got fatty chicken. We got stuff to help us work out. Lucy you ain't a fast. You you don't get those commercials. Clearly not. No, I see them sometimes when I watch Raw, but. I guess I don't it's pay enough fatty, attention. It's too fatty, though. It's, it's too much oil for me. I've I actually know. never I had KFC. Popeye's chicken. I hate KFC, so if it's anything like that, because it's just so greasy and gross, I, if it's anything like that, I don't think I'd want it in my life. All right. So anyway, their the... Twitter's kind of cool, though. Oh. oh, right. Ryan has to respond. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's yeah, neat. I mean, the fact that they're acknowledging wrestling is cool, and I, I just think who's ever running the social media clearly... Is a big wrestling fan, so it's cool. Yeah. I mean, humans are running that social media account, so why not? the fact that there's no like corporate overlord saying, Why the hell are they tweeting about the WWEs? What's is this awesome. Indie and, taker. Get... and who is yeah. he? Yeah. Are we selling that? No. Stop talking about it. It's it's awesome and it's it I like how it's just not just this corporate spewing of uh, of content. But thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Draven G, who asks, With the reports going around that Taker versus Cena has been nixed for WrestleMania, who do you think Undertaker's opponent should be? Some examples could be Joe, Finn. What do you guys think? I'm super disappointed that Cena and Taker is likely off the table because that that's really the last matchup I want to see with The Undertaker. I feel like the shape he's in and how, you know, he's gotten a lot older that I don't think, unlike Mark Henry, I just don't think there's a lot left in the tank. So, uh, yeah, it's very disappointing that we won't be seeing that this year. Uh, likely opponents, probably Braun Strowman seems like the most fitting one. Finn Balor would be cool as well. But I really feel like they want a heel to go up against The Undertaker. I'd be very surprised if Finn Balor came back as a heel. So I'm going to say Braun Strowman. I don't think there are many options. Aside from Strowman and John Cena, I don't really care about other matches. Even when Bray Wyatt battled The Undertaker, and this was during the podcast, I said it. Like, I, I don't care about this. It's just that whatever. That could have been so much more than it was. It could have been, but it wasn't. And we knew it, was, it wasn't going to be. Oh, you cut me so deep with that one. But but I think that's actually a very good point because the thing with an Undertaker match is Taker's probably going to win, right? So do you want to actually see somebody like Samoa Joe or Finn Balor lose to The Undertaker at WrestleMania? Probably not. Even Braun Strowman, he's got all the momentum in the world. Why destroy that by having him go against The Undertaker? I honestly think that if it's not going to be if it's not going to be on the level of somebody like John Cena or Kurt Angle even potentially it should be with some or it should be with somebody that's still moving up the ranks where a loss against the undertaker wouldn't really hurt that bad and i think the perfect person for that right now would be Baron Corbin yes it's not the most exciting match on paper but i feel like the undertaker and baron corbin could have a very good match and it could do more damn or it could do more good than damage for baron yeah ew. it could do but more it, damage yeah no damage it could do, man. yeah it could do very good for baron because 
he's not at that big level yet that it seems very feasible that The Undertaker could win it. So as long as he puts on a good performance, it comes out as a positive for somebody like it's Baron true. Corbin. I mean, it's Strowman isn't really on that level yet either, but... Uh, Strowman has that whole like unbeatable streak going, right? You Strowman's know? not human yet. Yeah, they. Yeah, exactly. His invincibility aura hasn't like died down yet. Whereas Corbin has taken some pinfall losses, which ends up kind of being more of a positive than a negative. Because it anyone does. who has that invincibility aura that Strowman has right now, it's so difficult for them to book them. They always have to BS their way around him not taking a pin, which ends up having just a lot of screwy finishes at pay-per-views and whatnot, because they gotta protect the other guy too. It's better to just take the pin and get it over with. And then there's that period after they take the pin where everybody can beat them with a finger poke. Just look yeah. at Rusev as exactly. an example. Case in point. But thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Sam H. Who asks, what's the one piece of WWE memorabilia you would love to own? Every wrestling game ever produced. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to go there easily. My one dream has been to have a full-on replica of the WCW World Heavyweight Championship, the big mm. gold belt, as uh, many people know it. I've even looked online. You can get a really good replica for about $1,500, which is, you know, a couple of dollars. It, it costs a little bit. But if there's any piece of, of memorabilia that I could own and just be satisfied. Now, I know that's WCW, but that's really the one thing that I would love to just have and wear and take it to work go to the bathroom with it, take a shower with it, just sleep with it. I want it. I want it so badly, Keith. Can I get it? Should we start a GoFundMe? Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one piece that I would definitely like would be a, like a prop protein case of the Simon system. Yes, I got the Simon Dean reference in before you screw oh, it. No, screw you, no. suck it. I did it. I won. No, I beat you. Don't steal my gimmick, boy. I don't know. For me, this is a tough one because I'm not a big memorabilia guy. I don't, uh, I'm not a big collectibles person. I, I used to be, but after a while, I just see it as clutter now. That's why I'm kind of like, I don't subscribe to the boxes or anything because I just don't want that in my yeah, life. Yeah, we need to get Juan on an episode of Hoarders with hit the We're way his there. video game hey, collection's going. We're getting come there. Come on, just because I have 39 games now on my mm -hmm. shelf, only about That's wrestling, wait. doesn't mean that I'm just getting obsessed. I'm not, I'm not getting obsessed. We're not, not there yet, but there will come a day. But the one thing that I've always wanted to own that um, I think it would be cool for a shelf is that replica million dollar title, just because I think it's dope. I'd settle for the, I guess if it's like a dream thing, I guess I'd settle for the real million dollar title at that point. That'd oh, be you know what cool. I want? Legit. Put it on the top of my house. The Smackdown fist. I'm just yeah. going to put it on the outside yep. of my house. Yep. I want the whole damn thing. You want the That's whole cool. fist? <laughs> I'm going to take that whole <laughs> fist, baby. Yeah, you are. <laughs> okay. All right, so thank you for the question. <laughs> Our next one comes in from Irish T, who asks... Hey, Bite That, it's me again. Well, hello there. Question hello. for you. What was your one favorite moment of 2016? It could be a promo, a turn, a match, someone breaking out and surprising you. It could be anything. Let's avoid the breakout. <laughs> yeah, we, we've... Oh, yeah, no. we, we've lived <laughs> better. You know, let Keith, let's give Ryan this question first. He... Yep. You have as much time as you want, Ryan. I'm just going to agree with Keith. What is your Keith. favorite moment? My favorite <laughs> WWE moment? Remember, Ryan, we live in a society of victims. So if you want to go down that road again, you're just... In 2016. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. it You know, it's really tough to pinpoint one exact moment. The first thing that came to my mind, though, was uh, The Miz's rant on Talking Smack. Because that was sort of just the catalyst for me of SmackDown. SmackDown was already gaining a lot of momentum, but that is what really put it over the top where I was like, okay, SmackDown is now the show to watch. And SmackDown has really been the beacon of light for me for WWE because Raw is a chore a lot of times. And I love doing this podcast and 
I like to cover Aww. both shows. And SmackDown keeps me motivated. Oh. For me, it's got to be the last episode of the Cruiserweight Classic for very similar reasons to what Ryan said. The main oh, WWE so shows are passable. Like, even, even SmackDown, for as good as it is, it's not a show that I go to bed on uh, Monday night, just can't wait, you know, for the day to go by on Tuesday. I am very happy with SmackDown. I'm very pleased with what happens on SmackDown. But the last episode of that season of the Cruiserweight Classic reminded me that WWE has the ability to pull off an awesome storytelling, high-impact, high-quality wrestling show that's not about your Roman Reigns or any of the top guys, that they're able to take guys from the seemingly no, like unknown, right? Like it's from the independent scene that maybe most of the WWE universe is not familiarized with, but they put it in such a high production format that when they announced the UK tournament, even though I didn't watch all of it, like I can't wait to just have a day where, hey, I'm just going to sit down and watch the matches that I didn't watch like during the tournament because I know the quality is there because I know they were able to deliver throughout the whole tournament. But specifically those two matches, like those last two matches in the classic are just no pun intended. Well, actually pun intended classics. To continue on the Cruiserweight Classic train, I have three, by the way. So to continue on the Cruiserweight Classic train, Kota Ibushi versus Brian Kendrick. There's a burning hammer in that match. There is nothing, there's nothing that comes close to the feeling that gave me when I saw that. It was so good. It was so good. My second moment, another one of the greatest matches of the year was the Survivor Series 5-on-5 five five match. Just that whole 45 minutes I am in absolute love with and probably my favorite series of moments throughout a match in uh, 2016, no question. My third one, and I can't believe you guys didn't bring this up. It blows my mind. It's the fact that in 2016, we got the birth of the greatest catchphrase to ever hit WWE television. And that is digging holes and taking souls. <laughs> it's one of the greatest moments in, in history. I'm still waiting for the Take a Rap album to drop. <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm going to leave that one there right now. All right. So <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the question. Our next one comes from Liam V, who asks, I've heard rumors that the Keith rap for episode 200 is on. Can you confirm this? But my real question is, did you check out Jerry the King Lawler's nipples on SmackDown? Oh, Seriously, yeah. speak the truth. Oh, yeah. So Nippy what's this heaven. rap? What's this rap thing about? Basically, Keith, you are Keith. That That is actually, that's not, I know Keith, you know, people get confused between you two. I sometimes, I sometimes yeah. get confused. But right. It's very confusing. You do have this hidden talent to just rap magic. Like unicorns come out, shooting rainbows and stars you? and stripes and bacon. So then you're okay. going to rap in episode 200. You're going to let out the anti-America rap, apparently. So you're going to go all heel. You're going to be our Shiki baby. Not just because I call you Shiki. You're going to be our Shiki baby for episode 200. And you're going to talk about or rap about why Canada is so great. The See, I don't, I don't understand where, like, where you heard that from. Because, okay, so here's a little thing that um, people might not know about me, but it's it's real that I'm terrible at rapping presents, and I actually get people to help me, and I I will pay them to wrap uh, gifts for me during the Christmas time for somebody's birthday. I'm not a very good rapper, so if you want me to rap something on. Uh, <laughs> On a podcast, first of all, it's audio. It would I sound very you. bad to hear all the crumpled paper. You. So, I, you know, Can I just wouldn't feel Keith? very comfortable with that. Can we do Keith rap for 200? You get some yourself some Caesar dressing, some lettuce. Yeah, lettuce okay. wrap. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lettuce Cheese wrap. and some chicken. Yeah. Yeah. Make yourself a chicken Caesar wrap. I could I could do that. I like chicken Caesar wraps. Okay. Yeah, I could, I could describe a wrap. Now, speaking of delicious, like we still got to talk about King's nipples. Um, 
I, I you already talked look about his the nipples, fist, man. I, I, I clearly <laughs> noticed he was not wearing a shirt. You know, people people complained about his shirts when he was on the Raw commentary team. Well, he he took that to heart, and He's rightfully like, so. You don't like these shirts? I am gonna wear one. All right. Um. Yeah. No, his little like cape thing. He was kind of blocking the nips to my knowledge so uh he's no big cast didn't, didn't really didn't really yeah he's not a big cast <laughs> always exposing that right nipple oh and you can't teach that <laughs> where are we it's going quite with easy, this now? we're just talking about nipples i no? think we need to move on <laughs> yes all right so thank you for the question our next one comes in from nancy l who asks hey guys with the most recent pairing of Carmella or El- and Ellsworth and uh, Alicia Fox and the Cedric Noam Dar storyline, I wanted to know who are your favorite on-screen couples in WWE history. Mine is Molly Holly and Spike Dudley. Not only did it make sense from a storyline, but it was also just overall great. It's a love storyline that, and that's something that we usually dismiss. Sorry, I got a little jumbled there, but it's but it worked. And I saw an old Raw where there was a six-man tag between the Dudleys and the Hollies, and this was Molly Holly and Spike Dudley's first Chris kiss. The crowd popped, they got and a it was a huge Chris. and amazing moment. <laughs> <laughs> you don't know about him, Chris Dudley? Boy, I'm a... Uh... <laughs> That whole rap thing got me... Or uh, King's Nips really got me all, all, me all <laughs> jittery. All flustered. <laughs> but yes, on-screen couples in the WWE. Who are your favorites? Ryan, you, you need a second, buddy? Uh, you, you look red, man. You're red. I'm good. I'm good. I'm just... Uh, Juan's answer I'm is still, obviously yeah. Billy and Chuck. <laughs> no, it's more Not of, that there's uh, anything wrong with that. Simon no, D and Simon System. I like that pairing. It's <laughs> yeah, a really nice couple. Shut up. Never Simon Deed and Maven. At least do Simon D and Maven, man. <laughs> okay, fine. Fine. <laughs> no, but I mean, one of the, the illogical answers is Agilita because of the actual story behind it right where it was that apparently and edge has talked about this uh to this point lita was unfaithful to matt that's why he became broken many years later <laughs> and then we got uh <laughs> keith was choked there's, there's, a a direct, there. <laughs> there's a direct one-to-one yeah, <laughs> relation one there to one. rebby just magically showed up but we have Lita and Matt, you know, that goes sour. So then Edge goes into the picture. Didn't feel the power. We as fans feel awkward as hell about this because we know that this is real. Matt actually got t- kicked out of the company. And then they have a live sex celebration in the middle of the ring. Them doing it, if you know what I'm saying. Just, oh my God, it was so awkward. <laughs> Th- but That was actually going to be... One of my picks, too, was Edge and Lita. They like it just worked because the, you know, Lita's uh, the image Lita was portraying at that time had gone real south. People didn't think too highly of her. So like her and Edge were just able to like make that kind of like crummy kind of disgusting couple that you wanted to hate. Like it worked really well and, and they played off each other very well. And yeah, that. That live sex celebration was super cringy and just uncomfortable, but really sold their relationship. They were believable. So, yeah, exactly. It worked. It was very, very believable. Um, there's, I can't really think of too many others off the top of my head that I was like really excited about. A lot of those have just uh, not worked out well. I mean, Lana and Rusev is an obvious example i think they play off each other really well they're on screen and real couple so obviously that chemistry is there the only acceptable answer is perry saturn and moppy so thank you for the question our next one comes from barnaballs right never forget moppy folks balls and balls asks what do you think about the following matches for wrestlemania this year so we will yay or nay them Kurt Angle versus AJ Styles. I'm going to say yay. Yay. I'm going to say yay with an asterisk. I would like to see other matchups. I know it hasn't happened in WWE. He's not following the rules. Yeah, yay or nay. Brock Lesnar versus Sami Zayn. I'm going to say nay. 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 All right. Seth Rollins versus Roman Reigns. 
Nay. I'm nay. nay. And this is a heel reigns. Nay. You know what? I'm going to say yay. They could have a good match. I broke my own rule. Thank you for the question. Our next <laughs> one hell? comes from the true prince of pro who asks, and you're going to need to help me on this one because boy, oh boy, I don't know. I don't get the context context here. Whatever happened to Keith's <laughs> real doll named Susan? Hashtag bite that history. What? Okay. Okay. One of our most popular YouTube clips. It was also one of our earliest is when we talked about Eva Marie when she had her first match in WWE way back in like 2013. So I remember that Keith was a train going, wreck. Keith was going on about how he thought uh Eva Marie's Eva Marie looked like a real doll or whatever. And if you don't know what that is, and I still back that up. Google it with safe search, please, with safe search. Um not family friendly. And then I guess I made like a passing joke to Keith, like, oh well what's yours called, Keith? And you said like Susan or whatever. So I don't know if you actually do have one or not, but when I made that joke, you did respond with a name. So and I don't care to know. Yeah. You're right. free to uh elaborate on that in any way you choose. Well I haven't seen Susan for a while. <laughs> that can be taken in many, many ways. And I'm going to leave it at that. If you want to make the fan fiction, I won't fan stop you. Fanfic fantasies. I won't fantasies. acknowledge you, but I won't stop you. How about that? All right. So our next question comes in from Snipin Sexton. Yeah. Greetings from Lawrence, Kansas. In the wake of the club's overturned tag title victory this week on Raw... Here's my question. Why don't we have referees with personality anymore? It seems like once in a blue moon, we get Charles Robertson helping the flares, but never anything more than that. I feel there's so much story to be told with referees. Like, say there was a perfect referee who never missed a call, so no heel ever wanted to be in a match with him. Or we could bring back somebody like Nick Patrick, who was just who just kind of sucked. And what, <laughs> oh, Nick Patrick man. was awesome. Poor Nick Patrick, man. Jesus. What do you guys think about referees in the WWE today? Have a great week. Thank you. That's a really tricky question because, I, I mean, while they do have things with referees like, what was it, Scott Armstrong? They had uh, him as kind of the crooked referee during like the CM Punk days or or no it would triple that was daniel bryan i'm sorry that not was daniel bryan. i'm thinking of brad maddox with that one um but yeah that was during the daniel bryan triple h storyline that they had scott armstrong as like the crooked referee the hashtag is, hard body ref if you yeah hashtag hard body ref can't for can't forget that okay so if you do the smart referee thing which sounds really really cool it just makes every other referee in wwe look like the idiots that they do play on tv it it would be awesome for a one-off storyline, but it totally damages the integrity of, like, everything else in the show. So that's the thing that kind of sucks about it. But it's really seeing tricky. Them, yeah, seeing referees implemented in different ways, I think, would be a cool idea. That they should be more than just the guy that's in the ring every once in a while. You don't want to overdo it, but I think it's cool to have them in the stories every once in a while. You remember that one time where I think it was Alberto Del Rio versus Jack Swagger and the referees went to a replay and like did like the whole football analysis yeah. and played it back and stuff. And then they never did it again. That's why we don't see things like that, because exactly. now we're like, oh, well, why don't they go to the replay yeah, again? Let, let's make fun of football once and then have people questioning for the rest of time why they don't always do that. Heels would never do any, would never get away with anything with the replays. It's why I found what happened on this week's Raw so annoying, because how many matches that we have where the referees out, get another one, get another one. And then the match just keeps happening with the other one. But yet here... You know, they were magically disqualified, even though in like the last 500 matches that never happened before. It's just yeah, stupid. Yeah, because this referee, he remembered that he got kicked in the face where all the other ones didn't remember. And that's the, the thing is like WWE could do so much of what they do now with the cheating and the referee not seeing it if they just did actually implement 
consistent rules that they adhered to. But it's always, no, there's no rule book. We're always just going to do what's convenient for the story that we want to tell now and just forget everything else in the past. Yeah, it's it's a lost art, really. It's an art that the Attitude Era killed because back in like the old WCW days, there were those rules like you weren't allowed to throw your opponent over the top rope. That was an immediate disqualification and they enforced that. But once the Attitude Era came along, it just became more of a story point than anything. And I don't know if it should go back at this point. It would be neat and it would add more legitimacy if that's what you're looking for in sports entertainment. But I don't know if that actually needs to exist. Well, okay, I'll put it this way, is you look at a lot of fictional universes, like you can look at Harry Potter, right? Harry Potter is a fictional universe, but they have, it has its own set of rules. Whereas I think the rules in WWE keep constantly changing, and that's the problem. And it's always going to keep happening, sadly. Indeed. So thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from Bo S., who asks, Hello, gentlemen. With Kurt Angle going into the Hall of Fame this year, who is on your guys' list of people that deserve to be in the Hall of Fame? It could be retired wrestlers or anybody. Mine would include Christian, Lex Luger, and beautiful Bobby Eaton or the Midnight Express. Thank you guys for all the hard work you do. Well, thank you. For me, the main answer, and it's not just because it's a rumor, it's uh, Diamond Dallas Page. Diamond Dallas Page was one of my favorite superstars in WCW because he was so different. WCW was very dry, especially in the main event scene. Like, I love the Cruiserweight division, like a lot of the other stuff, but there was something about the way he acted, the way he interacted. He was the real people champ before The Rock was. Like, The Rock called himself the people's champ as a cocky way, right? Like, oh, I've won these people. But DDP legitimately felt like he was part of that. And yeah, his WWE career, nothing to really talk about. But when you really think about all the contributions he made, right, to uh, bettering all these superstars, we talked about it with the rumors uh, last week. I think that's a really good option. And sort of looking at somebody else uh, is uh, Raven. Raven, I think, that is another guy that didn't really do a lot in WWE, but I've... Uh, there's a lot of shoot interviews with him and he seems to have had a lot of influence in helping other people's characters and himself and the mindset that he had in wrestling. This is super old, so I, I don't even know the name, but there are these documentaries where they basically just hang out with Raven for like a day or two. And the documentary is just him, like just going to places and talking. And it's fascinating. It's Paul Heyman esque in the way that he's just able to captivate you, considering he's not this emo guy. Like, the real Raven makes all these corny jokes, but then he switched the character on, and you're thinking to yourself, man, this guy's dark, he's gritty, and he's not in real life. Yeah, there's a lot of great names that should be included. I, I totally agree with DDP. Uh, Raven's also a great pick. I mean, he's just, he's someone who's, you know, a great mind for, for WWE. Um... Off the top of my head, I mean, the the Dudley boys would be a great addition. I don't, I mean, they're not fully retired yet, probably. So, so that's a thing where, uh, you know, I'm not too sure what's going to happen there. Um, but, you know, those are just a few off the top of my head. Yeah, I think DDP is number one on the top of my list as well. Nobody deserves it more than him, in my opinion, right now. Another person is that I think should really go in. And even though he's still like on the active roster kind of, and that's Paul Heyman just for everything that he's contributed to wrestling as a whole, even though he's still an active person, I think he deserves a spot in the hall of fame. He's very high on my personal list that and the rocks not in the hall of no, fame, right? Not yet. I, th I think it's just cause he's not officially retired. The Rock should go in. He's basically retired at this point. The Rock's basically, I mean, The Rock's in. It's just a matter of when they want to do it. Mm-hmm. All right, so thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from USC Punk 88 who asks, I've had the Undertale's megalo megalovania, I said that right, theme in my head all day. What are your some of your guys' favorite battle themes in video games? Easily, most of the themes from Final Fantasy Tactics, one of my favorite games of all time. 
especially that first battle when you leave the church, there's just it sets up the ambience for the rest of the game so well. And it's just epic. It's it's grand. It feels like a battle. It doesn't just feel like people are fighting. And aside from that, I would have to go with Star Ocean, the the standard battle theme. I love it. It pumps me up. Also, one of my favorite games of all time. I love me some more old school RPGs. Apparently. Got to go with the original Pokemon Red and Blue battle theme. Pretty epic. So th- that's definitely my favorite one. Uh, I like all the music in the Zelda games, for sure. Uh, Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask. So th- those are really my main favorites. The first thing that came to mind for me was the training music from Metal Gear Solid. I think is permanently burned into my head. The dun 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 dun. That and I've been thinking a lot about One Winged Angel lately, especially with uh, Kenny Omega at Wrestle Kingdom, but just the One Winged Angel track is so goddamn good. I think it's one of the best of all time. All right, so thank you for the question. Our next one comes in from the cynical cipher himself, who asks, The Bite That cast enters the 2017 Royal Rumble. What is your strategy? And if you get to the end, say we're down to the final three, who wins? Oh, boy. This is this is getting personal now. I mean, first, do we know our number? Like, are we going to go to the point where, okay, I know I'm going in as number 10. Or am I going in, like, thinking wrestling is real? I think that's maybe more fun to think about. Like, I'm going yeah. to win this even if I know I'm yeah. not supposed to. Think of it as a legit strategy. And things I've heard uh, wrestlers say before is that, you know, if the Royal Rumble was like a shoot, that it's so difficult to actually eliminate someone because you're just holding on for dear life to those ropes and you're just not letting go. But my strategy will be one that, uh, you know, someone like Vince McMahon has used before where, okay, I'm in the rumble. I'm going underneath that bottom rope and I'm just getting the hell out of there until it's down to like two people left. Or maybe I wait till the last person is there and then I slide in and try to eliminate them. And if they come at me, I'm just going to go to the corner, grip the rope for dear life. Maybe they'll tuck her out eventually, and I'll try to eliminate them again. Now, for me, and Keith, I'm sorry, buddy, but some confidential information will be shared, and you will hate me for this. So, at some point, I come out, I'm His like, social number... security number is... <laughs> yes, 000555. Um, I come out oh, at, like, shit. number 20... Ryan and Keith come out whenever. I just act like I have a massive leg cramp, but I'm just telling the ref, dude, I'm okay. I'm going to keep doing my thing. Eventually, somehow, don't question logic, Ryan and Keith end up being the final two. And then uh, Keith somehow super kicks Ryan over the top rope. Just massively. Logically, it's going to happen, even though Ryan's massively taller than both Keith and I are. Then I pull out my good old friend, the Tarantula. I go into oh. the ring. Just and not like the huge, Tajiri kind no, not either. not Tajiri. He's injured. <laughs> Get better soon. Just a real tarantula. And Keith is going to shit his pants so hard, he is going to fly over the third rope, over the top, eliminate himself Drew Carey style, and I'm going to point to that sign and say... I'm going yeah. to WrestleMania, baby. Yeah. The real, the more realistic version of that is when you go to get the tarantula, you realize it's been in your pocket the whole time, and you've been in a wrestling match, and it's just all squished, and it's a dead tarantula, and you're oh like, oh my crap. god, Keith would that still be scared. I, or I go get a steel chair and kill the damn thing. <laughs> I can go under the rope, get a chair. Just not That's over the, the head. head. You hit the back. Hit the tarantula yeah, back. You can't <laughs> hit right the tarantula in the head. Can't can't go into WrestleMania with a fine, but. My strategy would be similar to Ryan's, where let everybody else figure it out. I'll come in when the opportunity's right. Seems like the more people should do that in the Royal Rumble. Everybody should. It's it's seriously, that's like, that goes in line when we talked about, like, what would a shoot cage fight look like? It would look like two guys running to the opposite sides of the ring and trying to climb out of the cage first, right? (laughs) So (laughs) a shoot Royal Rumble would probably be everyone going under the damn top rope and being like, I'll let these guys sort it out. But if everybody does that, then what the hell happens? It's like, what are we all doing here? It just turns into that weird 
TNA outside the ring battle royal thing that they did. They right. did that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep. they did that. Like first people to the Don't ring watch going that. to a match and then whatever. It was stupid. All right, man. Let's we gotta do it, man. We gotta bring in five dollar wrestling's first man standing match if they're gonna do an outside <laughs> the ring battle royal. So good. Oh god. Five dollar wrestling is the best. But if we if it was down to us three, how I realistically see it going is I would probably be the first one to break the pact. I'd turn on one of them. They'd eliminate me. And I'm going to go with Ryan would probably win, just from size of being a giant man. He would go on to WrestleMania, point at the sign, and me and Juan would be sad. And we just kick and the living shit out of him, man. And then you and absolutely. me, buddy, handicap match for the title <laughs> yep. of Mania. He won't make it to Mania if I have anything to say about it. So thank you for the question that got really dark there. Our final question of the show comes from Collector9000, who asks, In your opinion, who is an active wrestler that should retire? The Undertaker. Sorry. Yeah. I just need to get that out. Okay. Tyler you're, Bate. You're, Tyler you're right. Because he makes us look <laughs> bad. At 19, just, just get yeah. it over with, man. You're making everybody look bad by being so damn good at only 19. Seriously, people, watch that last match at least. And just think the whole time, he's 19. Most people mo most people have like their first match around that time, like televised, and it's horrible. But yet this guy's so damn good. He's 19 and UK champion. What the hell are you doing with your life? Ask yourself that. Or, I, you know, I'm asking you that. Well, you don't have to ask yourself <laughs> yeah, that. Like, I just asked you that. Why are you that. telling me to people like that? Notice. You can do that yourself, man. That and I'm just going to say broken. Sin Cara should retire. Just the character, yeah. not the person Wait, behind um, the mask. Okay. Just retire Sin Cara, please. He's a stigma to professional wrestling. And Alberto yeah. Del Rio because he's a menace to society. <laughs> Jeez, that, that got dark. They yeah, say it's, it's hard he's to a agree. menace, but I love him. It's hard to disagree with any of those. And Collector did actually have a second question before Ryan so nicely cut me off there. Thanks, buddy. And Collector asks... Who do you think is responsible for killing WCW and who is killing TNA? Relying on old stuff. TNA is bringing back now Don West, which okay, but there's rumors about Jeff Jarrett coming back. And Jeff Jarrett was like the top dog yeah, in WCW when they were going to go out of business. And I was a little kid back then and I stopped. I didn't, I don't think I've ever said this part. I always said like, I can watch. I don't think I even, even told you guys like, I couldn't watch uh, WWF because I didn't have USA or TNN at that point. And then I would basically watch WCW. And whenever Jeff Jarrett would come on, I would tune away. I would go to Toonami and watch some DBZ or, or whatever the hell else was on. Jeff Jarrett to me was just the dullest thing ever, man. Just dull. Dull. And then his TNA run. Oh, he, he gave like early 2000s Triple H a run for his freaking money. So him. Yeah, him. so what actually killed WCW? It was kind of like a combination of a lot of things, of letting a lot of the uh, higher paid wrestlers kind of do their own booking, and then you had Vince Russo going crazy, and just a lot of bad decision making is probably what led to that. What is killing TNA? Well, Dixie Carter was killing TNA for, for quite a while with some uh, poor decision making and now you see that okay jeff jarrett's out of tna dixie carter's out of tna and it's like okay finally tna like it's it's under some you know it's under new management like what could happen and now jeff jarrett's coming back like come on man come on like tna was finally gonna be free of all of this to to really have somebody else maybe with a different vision for it I, I, I don't want to see Jeff Jarrett come back. I want to see just a new direction completely for TNA. So it's pretty disappointing. But he puts yeah. hashtag blame Keith. Keith is killing TNA. Apparently. With, with things like that, I think it's impossible to really pinpoint it at one event that ended up killing a company just because 
it's usually a series of bad decisions that lead to its downfall or lead to it falling behind. And that's what did it for WCW. It was the creative control. It was the Vince. It was Vince Russo's chain of bad decisions and just how they never adapted when they got worse as the WWE slash F got better. And with TNA, it's pretty close to the same story. And it has been for years where it's just a series of poor choices and a series of momentum killers. I think that's TNA's. I haven't watched the product in a long time, just bits and pieces uh, recently. But when I watched it, which was um, like the late 2000s, before it was basically before Hulk Hogan and Eric Bischoff came in. The thing that I always complained about TNA was that they would get steam. They would have something really cool happen. Then all of a sudden they just flush it down the toilet. All the they had all the momentum in the world so many times, and they just fumbled it. And it's gotten to a point where they need to hit a home run in the worst way to recover. And with this talk about Jeff Jarrett coming in, I don't see them hitting that home run. And then there's there's also yeah. the, like there's also that time where, much like the WCW situation, when. TNA kept fumbling. The WWE kept building its empire. Like when TNA was supposed to be the WWE killer, the WWE just kept getting better, kept gaining more ground. And now they're so untouchable that nothing is probably ever going to come close again. So you, one might argue TNA screwed it up for everybody. (laughs) Yeah. And and the one closing comment I want to say about this is TNA had Okada. TNA had guys like uh, AJ Styles. Okada, I don't know. What's he doing right now? Main eventing Wrestle Kingdom? I have don't him, know. Have him get squashed by Kevin Nash. <laughs> yeah, like when you have the talent that other companies just took and built upon in no time. Look at AJ. He's the top guy on SmackDown in no time at all. Like, what's what's your excuse? Like, oh, you're the company from Orlando? Bull crap. Bull crap, because by that account, NXT should be discarded, because even though NXT is a WWE-owned company, the roster is not WWE's roster. It is not the WWE presentation. It is not the WWE length. It would it would just fail. WWE had metal. WWE had velocity, heat. Those programs failed. They're no longer here. What made NXT so different? They believed in what they were doing. They were consistent about that. TNA hasn't been like that. They, they were always the flavor of the month. Let's bring in some more Joe. Getting him, get him at the top, then put it down at the bottom. Then before he leaves, hey, let's put him back at the top again, even though we did dick all with the guy for years. It's bull crap. Yep. It's bull crap. It's like my final thing is TNA had history right in its face about how a company can fail in WCW, and they chose to follow that exact model instead of going in a completely different direction. And it doesn't surprise you when you see that the company's had the troubles that it's had. Now, it seemed to be kind of getting out of that mess. We'll have to see what happens from here. Yeah, the only ultimate thing here is patience. Anthem unleashed a new logo. I think it's horrible. <laughs> Not the first and best uh, first impression. But I'm hoping that they want to get the fans that were so invested into TNA. I watched more TNA than WWE for a very small period of time. For a very small period of time, I did. But I would love the idea of, hey, instead of watching Raw, I'll catch up with TNA. So thank you, everybody, for sending your awesome, awesome questions. You never know. Like this question, maybe nobody thought it was going to be as serious as it was. Yet I got pissed off through it because it's like, damn, you, you had it. You had everything that you needed to make the company what it is. Like, why do you make so many bad decisions? Dixie Carter's gone. No excuse now as to your your you holding yourself out of success but uh for a lot of information head on over to bite that.com ryan will remind you just in case about the cool things happening including the giveaway and then you go on to your regularly scheduled life yeah so thank you guys again for uh listening to another edition of the podcast uh so yeah as always we got our youtube channel youtube.com slash bite that cast got some cool things going on Including this weekend, we have the Shut Your Rumble, which is a simulated uh, rumble that we do in uh, WWE Shut Your Mouth. Uh, that's open for early yeah. access on our Patreon. So patreon.com slash bite that if you want to support us 
for as little as a dollar a month, you can get some sweet things like a raw and uncut video version of the podcast, which is sometimes up before the actual podcast itself is up, so that's pretty awesome, and uh, tons of cool perks going on there. So, mentioning the giveaway, we have the Royal Rumble Pool, so Thursday... January 19th, right? Uh, let me check the date again. Let me check yes, it. Yes, it's January 19th. Yeah. Keep an eye out. Twitter, uh, at ByteThatCast. It's going to be a pinned tweet with information on how to enter our Royal Rumble pool. There's only going to be 30 available spots, so you want to get there quick when you hear that it's there. So uh, keep checking our uh, Twitter throughout the day. Uh, and the winner of that, you'll be assigned a number, one from 30. And if your entrant wins the Royal Rumble, then you win a $10 Amazon gift card. So that's going to do it for this week, guys. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week.